Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Bridge webinar. Our, speaker today's, our speakers today are Keith and John from Cleveland Electric Laboratories. They're going to speak to us about their fiber optic uh, technology used for bridge monitoring. Um, their clients include several DOTs, the Federal Highway Administration, and prominent civil engineering firms. The presentation will also cover some structures that are currently being monitored. There'll be some case studies, and you'll get to view the, the interface that they've developed and that they use. Without any further ado, I'd like to turn things over to Keith and John and, uh, and let them begin the webinar. Some background on fiber optics and two case studies. The first case study is our flagship, the Indian River Inlet Bridge, located in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware. This was a new construction cable stay bridge and a design build effort led by SCADSCA and AECOM with a minimum 100 year design life. The project was tasked as a design to be a comprehensive structural health monitoring system and to better understand the bridge's behavior and aid in the long term maintenance and operation of the structure. CEL, along with the University of Delaware Center for Innovative Bridge Engineering, developed the concept and design for this innovative, robust fiber optic monitoring system versus conventional systems. The intent was to provide quantitative data on long-term performance, which was to augment traditional inspection. A new construction project usually presents itself with challenges, and this one did not disappoint. Additionally, the SHM system proved instrumental to the Delaware DOT during Hurricane Sandy. Our second case study will be the I-20 bridge located in Vicksburg, Mississippi. This was an existing steel truss bridge over the Mississippi River with a critical fault line passing between two piers. Partners included the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Mississippi and Louisiana DOTs, and was funded by the Department of Defense. CEL has been around since 1920. Our corporate headquarters are located in Twinsburg, Ohio, and we were serving originally the high temperature needs, those above 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit for markets and industries such as aerospace, steel, glass, and heat treating. In 2004, our VP Roger Shepard started the Advanced Technologies Group in Tempe, Arizona with a small but talented staff focused on the design and fabrication for turbine engine test cell instrumentation Shortly after that, this group of engineers began to develop fiber optic sensing technologies. They saw significant advantages for many applications as compared to conventional analog sensors. We were then partnered with Keith Chandler from Chandler, Handling, Chandler Monitoring Systems. Today, this team has deployed fiber optic systems around the world in many different markets, including oil and gas, mining, civil engineering, and security. Well, for starters, Maybe you aren't aware virtually any physical parameter can be measured with fiber optics, including, but not limited to, temperature, movement, pressure, sound, vibration, and even intrusion. However, there are really two main advantages versus conventional methods that perhaps over time you have grown more comfortable with. The first, immunity to noise. This leads to a much cleaner measurement data. The second, significantly easier to install. There's no cabling, conduits, data loggers, and junction boxes that are in the system, and they can be greatly reduced. No power is necessary at the sensor locations themselves. So what are fiber optics and FBGs exactly? At a high level, fiber brad gratings, commonly referred to as FBGs, are a well-established technology and internationally proven. Additionally, fiber optic sensors are easily multiplexed. What does that mean? Several can be strung along a single mode fiber, including mixing sensor types. Now, Keith Chandler will go into a greater explanation of how FPGs work. This is a brief explanation of how fiber optics work. Um, I'm going to start with the center two slots here. So, when fiber is being produced in a factory, um, it's being drawn at high speeds. And along that tower, there are masks. And they use UV lasers to launch through that mask to produce mirrors within the fiber optics, and usually within a 10 millimeter uh, distance. 
the advantages, um, you know, when it comes to installing, you're not having to place multiple DAC units or data acquisition units. Um, you just place one if it's on the bridge itself. Uh, you don't have to have multiple instruments to do high number counts on sensors. Uh, even small sensor counts, uh, there are smaller interrogators to accommodate that as well. But the simplicity of the cabling and the flexibility of being able to, uh, to add to the system at later dates without changing or adding to the infrastructure that's there is very, very valuable. Um, the integration of other types of devices, you know, over fiber by using AD converters uh, is something that we had done on Indian River, where cameras and weather stations are carried over the same backbones uh, that the optical sensors are. And since they are of a different wavelength, we can run those devices over the same exact fiber with no interference to the optical sensors themselves. Plus, it's a time saving. Um, that's, that's where we gain a lot of ground. Uh, when we do installations or prepping for new applications, the time savings that's involved uh, is, um, is valuable from a cost standpoint. We use our models in our GUI software in teleoptics. Um, you know, there's a graphical interface that we use, so we actually take these models and break them up into zones and uh, place them into the software. Uh, this is an example of uh, some pre-recorded uh, online systems that we have to where we're using the IntelliOptics software graphical interface. There's a very powerful Microsoft Office, I mean Microsoft SQL database enterprise uh, that we um, uh, collect all the information. Uh, that The software also uh, is very key in sending out, um, you know, weekly reports. If there happens to be a sensor in the red, like you see here, uh, then uh, you would get an immediate warning, whether it be by text, voice, uh, or email. Uh, we also, analytics, you know, not just taking raw information, but being able to use those analytics, um, you know, to determine predictive analysis of future events. Uh, so that you can, from a maintenance standpoint, uh, you have something that the maintenance engineer or our bridge maintenance personnel can use to actually go back and look at certain areas on our bridge in a very specific way. So we're going to move to the uh, Indian River case study. As John had mentioned, it is our flagship. Um, as far as bridges, uh, it was we installed the system uh, from its conception and its design, how the conduits were ran, um, and to also ensure the safety of uh, the the people who are working on the bridge. Um, so as they would pour each section, we would embed sensors in the concrete, and I'll show you how we did that. And like I said earlier, uh, later on, it was decided for the Homeland Security System to be installed um, that the DOD uh, had funded uh, in the Federal Highway Authorities. Uh, so we didn't have to change anything in the infrastructure. All we had to do was add the additional optical sensors to uh, produce a, a very nice security system. Of course, in the very beginning, the pylons was the, the first thing that we had to uh, install the uh, optical sensors in, mounted to the rebars. Um, you had to come up with a lot of methods. This was the very first optical system. No one had ever done it before. Uh, we created a lot of very special applications and ways to run uh, the cabling in the concrete and not damage uh, the fiber. So on the pylons, for instance, um, before the forms were put into place, we would go back and place the sensors, run the optical cable, but we had to have a way to exit out of those pylons after the concrete cure. So simply, we just took a PCB pipe, uh, placed wood on the inside with a rubber cap, 
with optical inlets, uh, seals, uh, to the interior of the PVC pipe. So when the forms were put on the inside here, we would screw into this wood piece and it would hold it in place. And, uh, and then when the forms were removed, of course, the screw was pulled out and the forms removed. Uh, in turn, once the curing process had taken place, then there's holes that are in the concrete at the different tier levels. And so we just cut the rubber on the end and pull the fiber out and, of course, array from one level to the other all the way to the top for accelerometers, tilts, all the uh, optical security systems that were placed in uh, for the uh, pylon entryways and also the hatch doors. The security system, uh, we were well into this project, about a year into the project, and then they made the request that we need a homeland security system uh, on this structure. So we placed various cameras, uh, and you see here under the deck, they had infrared um, that was used on them. They had long range, so they could see at night. And then, of course, the capability of 36x zoom for anything that may happen underneath the bridge. Um, now, these platforms at each pylon, we put optical sensors. And these are very, very sensitive uh, and very accurate. If anyone steps on these, uh, on the platforms, then these cameras would train on those locations. If, also, with the optical switches I was showing you earlier, if you open this door, then the cameras would train on that location. Same thing for the hatch doors, that we put cameras on, on the pylons. Uh, they were used for multiple purposes, not just for security, but for accidents uh, or things that may occur on the bridge. They were used for that purpose as well in the command and control center. Um, but, there, but these cameras were smart, and uh, they responded directly to the sensors that were being activated. Further on the security, you know, this is the uh, optical switch I was showing you earlier, but we used that optical switch on the communications hut that was underneath the bridge. Uh, this communications hut with, hutch uh, was used to also place uh, local telecommunications in that area, as well as our equipment, which is shown here, and a power backup generator, uh, diesel generator that was behind the house, and UPS systems on the inside. But uh, also in that house, the, uh, the navigational lights on the bridge and the lighting on the cables and the aerial lights were all controlled from this location. Uh, a lot of, uh, about half of that was actually incorporated into our system since we already had the PCs in place. Uh, we placed a lot of the UPS software and also the generator. We, we could tell them whether it was operational or not uh, as a, an additional backup. Uh, this is a view of the control panel that we had. Uh, one system on this side was for security. One system here was for the structural health monitoring system. And same thing with the interrogator. We had one interrogator for structural, uh, structural health and then one for security. Uh, they wanted a redundant system so that if this PC crashed or this workstation crashed, the other one would take over its job. Uh, so we use smart uh, IP addressable switches for all the cameras, for the interrogators to switch from one PC to the other if needed. Uh, this happened once in the last seven years to where there was a hard drive failure and this system here had to take over the work of this one. Um, you know, there's a, and there's also uh, RAID drive backups and uh, of course sharing of monitors and keyboards and mouses. Um, the information from this location was transmitted to the command and control center, the traffic management center uh, for Dell Uh Now one of the final steps uh, that we took for uh, before the bridge was open was doing a load test. So I'm gonna run a video 
and uh, let you listen to this. It's a short clip of what we did to come up with a baseline for all of the information that was gathered. With construction nearly complete and the bridge ready to open fully, the monitoring team performed an initial load test using dump trucks weighing roughly 64,000 pounds each. Starting with a single truck and working up to four, 17 passes were made using a variety of patterns while the sensor data was recorded. For the bulk of the passes, the trucks moved at a constant speed of 10 miles per hour across the span in single, side-by-side, -side, and inline patterns designed to distribute the loads in multiple ways. Ultimately finishing with two high-speed passes, the data recorded during this test will serve as a baseline for the bridge, and future tests will be compared with these readings to gauge performance over time. This load test was a significant milestone for the monitoring team as it marked the end of the two-and-a-half-year installation phase of the project. And this is not quite as in-depth as the other case study due to Tom, uh, but this was the I-20 bridge uh, in Vicksburg, Mississippi, between Mississippi and Louisiana. But there was a fault line between these two piers. It did move, uh, moved suddenly like three feet, and they had to rebuild a large section of this bridge because of that movement. So when that was done, the, um, uh, the, the, the system was asked by the DOD, I also funded this and the Corps Car of Engineers, asked, yes, we would like to see what you could do with security and barge impact systems. So, Moving forward, we, we placed cameras on an adjacent bridge here, and we had a camera here and here in those locations so that uh, uh, we could capture any events should these piers be impacted. And then, of course, a map in which we work with structural engineers to position sensors in a very specific way. Uh, expansion joints were made in such a way that if these this fault line were to move again, it would allow uh, the movement without damaging the bridge. So there again, um, through the modeling, we used the models that we built, very simple models, very easy to build from our libraries, um, and showing sensor locations. Uh, but we also, with the security system, there's an optical mat where uh, fiber optics is actually embedded inside of this mat. And if anyone walks on this mat, uh, then it would send off an alarm. There again, through the, uh, the cameras were trained on those locations. And same thing would happen if any of the hatch doors was opened. And the reason they wanted this is because there was a lot of activity, even though the access to these piers are locked. Uh, people would find a way around them, kids, um, as well as vagrants living under the bridge. So the barge impact system I was describing uh, just a minute ago, uh, we did uh, uh, back in March, on March 23rd, 2012, a barge did impact uh, the bridge. Now, 20 of them broke loose. Um, but only one actually impacted the pier. When it was impacted, the cameras were immediately activated. And before anyone could call the DOTs or uh, any municipalities, uh, this had already sent a warning to both the Louisiana DOT as well as the Mississippi DOT. So we were charged with monitoring because they had to cut the uh, to 24 hours a day for about a month. They had to cut that barge in half. That was the only way they could remove it from the uh, the pier uh, because it had embedded itself into the mud below the piers uh, to the point that it could not be pushed away with tugs. Uh, so it was cut in half. So a lot of vibration was distributed to uh, to the pier itself, and they wanted to keep the bridge open while this process was taking place. <laughs> 